Okay, welcome everyone to the 10 years of strategizing activities and practices interest group distinguished keynote panel. And my name is Virpi Sorsa and I'm the chair of the strategizing activities and practices interest group. And together with our program chair, Leonard Dobush, we invited three distinguished scholars uh, to be panelists for our keynote. Julia Balakun, David Seidel and, and Richard Whittington. And I have a pleasure to uh, do the introduction to this panel distinguished keynote. So we are celebrating our 10th anniversary and that means that we get roses. So a lot of roses to everyone who's there around the world and, and wherever you are, hopefully the scent of the roses reaches you, although we are in different places. I have really the pleasure to thank those who created this interest group. And this is a picture taken 10 years ago in, in San Antonio, and you see many familiar faces here. Those scholars who in their research and education actually created all this research of strategy as practice and with their amazing work that was published in top tier journals they have actually created the path for all of us who have then after after this group of founders started to do strategy as practice research I also have a pleasure to thank our current executive committee, who's the one who's uh, um, uh, created the, the activities for, for strategizing activities and practices interest group for the uh, Academy of Management 2021 and, and our program here in, in this online conference that we have at the moment. This is a snapshot where we are today. So we have total active members of 687. And th this is an amazing number for us because it's a growing number. It's been growing over the years from 10 years ago when the number was a bit over 400 scholars. So, so we, we have an amazing growing community, which is a diverse scholars all over the world. And also the community, which is very strong, and we are very proud of, of this community. So today we have a distinguished keynote panel where those founders who, who have been uh, working on strategy as practice research and, and education over uh, even over the 10 years past that we have had in the Academy of Management, these are the, the distinguished uh, scholars who, who before the, the interest group was established in the Academy of Management, created the, the work that, that was then uh, getting so much attention that, that the group was at, established uh, uh, as an interest group in the Academy of Management. And today, Julia Balogun and David Saido and Richard Whittington will talk about their, um, their memories of, of how this group came about and how this research came about. And they will also talk about where this research is, is going. So, so I have a, a, a great pleasure to, to invite uh, Julia Balogun to first start with her uh, celebration of our 10 year path and uh, Julia if you are here please uh, start with your your memories of of strategy as practice thank you Virpi yes I am here and apologies for being a few minutes late in joining I hope everyone can hear me um hello everybody um, good afternoon from the UK, if not almost good evening. Um, I know we're, all, we're joining at all kinds of odd times, so it's, it's, it's lovely to be here with you all. And thank you to Veerpi for that wonderful introduction. Um, it was great to see that the photo taken so many years ago, the new executive team, none of, them, none of them are in that photo. So it's wonderful to see how the community has evolved. That was brilliant. Thank you, Veerpi. 
So my role here is at this point to say a little bit about the creation of the interest group as part of the celebration. Um, the start point actually extends back to beyond 10 years, to almost 2007, I think. That might seem a little bit odd, but let me explain. I think, as I said at the Academy before, actually one of the individuals we have to most thank for the existence of this interest group is, is, is uh, Karen Golden Biddle. Um, I met Karen in Boston back in 2007 when she was kind enough to invite me to give a talk at Boston University to her PhD students when I was visiting um, Jean Bartunic at Boston College. And um, she reflected on what I was saying about the strategies practice community to say that what we were really about and what we were doing with our research and our work was creating a movement, creating a space for our work in the journals through the work we were publishing and the work we were doing on editorial boards. And I guess well, that was what we were doing, but maybe I hadn't really thought about it in those terms. Um, so when I got back, I discussed this with Richard and at the time, Jerry Johnson. Um, and she'd also, as the, 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 the two of the earliest founders really of the SA Strategies Practice Community, um, and said that Karen has suggested an interest group. And we kind of went, well, no, it's not going to wash. The Academy is not going to go for another interest group. Forget it. Um, but the idea never went away. So I approached Karen again, I think it must have been two, probably summer 2008. Uh, she was on the Academy executive at that time and discussed it with her. And she said, but well, we were wrong. The Academy would be open to a new interest group, particularly one with a big international footprint, like the one we were talking about and explained how to go about it and who to contact. So off we went. It was a huge job. Um, you might not realize that you don't just have to write a proposal, but to get something like this through, you have to get an get enough signatories to have 1% of the Academy of Management members signed up to the idea. 1%, when we know how big the Academy was, it's like, seriously? Um, but, you know, uh, we managed it. Um, we, we worked really hard. We fortunately all had quite good networks and we all drew on those networks. We had this huge spreadsheet with different names we were suggesting to email to get the, to get the contacts. Um, and we also had to ensure we had support of other divisions who didn't feel we were standing on their territory. So the support of divisions like BPS as it was and ODC. Um, but we got the signatories, we got the commitment, we put the case in, and um, I don't think we really believed it would happen. And I suppose for me, the main reflection is that I remember very well when I got the email saying, congratulations, you have an interest group. I know I were, where I was and what I was doing. It was Christmas. I was on a skiing holiday with my family in Megève in France. This email popped up on my phone, I think it was on my phone, I think phones could take emails then, uh, quite late at night, because of course it was coming from the US and I was in Europe, saying, you've got an interest group. And it's a bit like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Because I don't think any of us really believed it would happen. Christmas did come early, it came 48 hours early. And that was the start. And I suppose that that's my memory really of the interest group. That's how it was born. And we've had the privilege of working together ever since. And I think particularly saying, celebrating the extension of the group as individuals like Virpi and Leonard have joined um, because I think one of the successes of our group has been the way we've developed early career researchers and we're I think as some of the founding members very proud of that and as I say the rest is history so at this point it is my privilege to pass over to David who's someone I've worked with in the SAP field since I think the end of the 1990s um, as is a, and is a fantastic scholar whose work I really value so David over to you. Thank you, Julia, and thank you for this brilliant introduction. Um, I'll um, continue talking a little bit about the empirical um, domain of strategy as practice. And then Richard will talk a little bit about the theoretical approaches, and then uh, Julia will um, go back to or will continue with the methodological approaches that uh, have developed over the years in strategy as practice. And also start a little bit um, historically. Um, so where does strategy as practice come from? And every uh, reconstruct it dif uh, slightly differently. And here I would say are four papers and five people who um, sort of started where early precursors, important precursors to um, strategy as practice, uh, writing papers and that uh, called uh, or set up a, uh, a program or called for a research program on studying the doing of strategy with Knights and Morgan in 1991 in the uh, US, um, uh, Annie Pai in a paper uh, in uh, management learning that uh, hasn't uh, received the attention it deserves, but it's really important in that it already is an early precursor calling for research in, uh, on the doing of strategy. Then of course, Richard Whittington with his long range planning paper that 
actually called it strategy as practice. And then my supervisor, John Henry, uh, who in 2000 had a paper in which he, uh, in the title, also talked about uh, strategy as a social practice. And these were early precursors to the official launch of strategy as practice in the seminal special issue of uh, Journal of Management Studies in 2003 with uh, Richard and uh, Jerry Johnson and Life Melin who then officially launched strategy as practice. Yeah? And they called for a close understanding of the myriad micro activities that make up strategy and strategy and practice uh, as practice. Uh, um, and they uh, go on to say that this special issue has grown out of an interest in the micro level activity and practices that um, um, uh, the editors along with others have been developing over the past years. So they have been calling for research into particular empirical phenomena, i.e. the doing of strategy. And that then took off. And here is an overview of the papers over the last two decades. Uh, the number of uh, strategy as practice publications um, over the years, and you can see sort of how it took off after 2003 um, uh, with the seminal special issue and then growing up to 2014, after which it has on average uh, had uh, uh, more than 40 papers, uh, journal papers per year. So a very steady and consistent uh, um, uh, number of publications. What you also see in here, and that's highlighted in gray, the different special issues on strategy as practice. Yeah, And I when myself was surprised putting these uh, slides together and looking at the numbers, uh, how many special issues there have actually been and special issues might not have been aware of. Of course, you know, the JMS special issue, the two JMS special issues, the SMJ special issue in 2018, the human relations special issue, but also a lot of other, the long range planning special issue, the journal of strategic information systems special issue, the business history special issue. So lots of different special issues and even year after year special issues which shows that there's so much here, uh, so much material, so much uh, to look at that uh, journals have devoted different special issues to that. So that's over the years. And now um, my little anecdote, I remember when we had um, a little conference around the JMS special issue in 2003, or actually before that, uh, to, to develop the papers for this special issue, there were discussions amongst the senior scholars. I was, uh, I just finished my PhD together with Julia. She also had just finished her PhD. And the, 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 the senior scholars discussed whether it would be ethical, whether it would be irresp uh, 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 irresponsible to suggest to students to do a PhD on strategist practice. Uh, since uh, they wouldn't know whether strategy as practice would uh, take off or whether it would be a failure, or whether it would be possible in the future to publish these studies. And uh, as we can see now with this impressive and successful, uh, uh, impressive number of publications over the years, um, if you started your PhD at that time on strategy as practice, you were on a good track. Now, let me look a little bit at uh, the empirical uh, domain, empirical phenomena that strategy as practice research has looked at. And I'll talk first about the initial uh, focus and then how it has developed over the years. I would say uh, at the beginning, uh, there were three things that um, the strategy as practice research program was emphasizing. The first one was the micro activities, looking at the micro activities, the micro doings of strategy. A second aspect that I found uh, quite important was uh, the reappreciation of the formal aspects of strategy next to the informal one. After Minsberg, the focus has been very much on the informal parts and the formal parts aren't really that important, but strategist practice emphasized very much sort of, we need to study the formal aspects of strategy, strategy meetings, the strategy workshops, the strategy tools and so on. These are important. These are important because we invest a lot of money in them. We invest a lot of time in them. We invest a lot of energy in them. And in that sense, they are important, even if they are important in different ways than initially thought or whatever. And finally, um, the third aspect is um, the um, recognition of the many different strategy actors that contribute to strategy making. Um, next to CEOs, the, uh, the middle managers, consultants, even their employees that participate in strategy making or whatever. So I would say that was the initial empirical uh, focus and that has uh, been extended uh, over the years. Yeah? And particularly uh, late, I mean, you can see this already in early publications, but later on, the much more this, uh, the, the emphasis on linking the micro to the macro. It's not enough just to look at the micro actions, but to link that to more to the macro context in which it's embedded. Uh, 
And uh, Richard uh, uh, once referred to this as the danger of micro-isolationism. If you just look at the individual activities without the larger context, you might be uh, um, uh, in problem. A second aspect uh, that came in over the years is particularly this uh, also strategy as a macro practice. And that goes back to Knight and Morgan's early 1991 paper. They also talked about strategy as a, a macro practice, like medicine is a general practice, not just the individual practices within that, but the macro practice. Uh, and we could see sort of how this macro practice develops, particularly at the moment, the research on open strategy as a change, uh, I mean, as a new form of doing strategy. Uh, so you will see changes in the macro strategy, um, in the macro practice of strategy from I mean, if you look at it historically, on strategic planning, strategic management to open strategy. Also, Richard's uh, work on strategy as a profession yeah, uh, that falls into that. And the third aspect that newer uh, research has particularly highlighted is uh, are the mundane practice of strategy enactment. Um, the museum guides who enact strategy, uh, 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 well-known paper by Julia um, and uh, colleagues, uh, and looking at how museum guides enact the, the strategy of the museum or telecommunications engineers um, uh, who enact the strategy of the organization. So that's um, sort of the, the empirical scope, how it has changed over the years. And now an important question that has come up from the beginning and uh, has now just been uh, um, uh, put attention to a particular uh, uh, recent paper by Paula Jasikowski. It's a question what activities, what practices classify as strategic or strategically relevant? What activities, what practices should we as strategists, practice scholars look at? And uh, in this paper, which uh, just appeared in uh, Organization Theory, she, uh, um, she, she tells the story of how a senior uh, um, strategy scholar approached her once and said, well, uh, what you're studying is definitely practice. But is it strategy? And that raised the question, so though, what uh, qualifies as strategic practice or activity? And what I would just uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, a little bit is the different views on that. And I would say there are four views, uh, crudely dif uh, differentiate, four views on what practice or what activities uh, qualify as strategic and should be studied by strategy as practice scholars. The first view is, uh, and this is just an overview, and later on I'll say a little bit more. The first view is, um, those practices are strategic that are labeled strategic, like strategy workshops or whatever. Second view is um, we could uh, think of all practices and or, or activities that are enacted by strategists as strategically relevant and as something that we should study. The third view is um, uh, we can consider those activities and practices strategic that have strategic outcomes. Yeah. Uh, whatever that, uh, uh, however you define those outcomes, but somehow that they uh, are consequential. And the fourth view is uh, we can say those practices or activities are strategic that, that are constitutive of a strategic pattern. Going back to means that idea that strategy is a pattern in a stream of actions. So all those actions that sort of make up the stream, uh, this pattern in the stream, could be considered strategic. And I'll quickly uh, go through these four views and uh, try to show you what we see um, uh, when we take one view or the other view, or what comes into view by uh, taking one view or the other. So the first view, uh, if we say those practices are strategic that are treated by the practitioners themselves as strategic, strategy meetings, strategy workshops, strategy tools, wherever it says strategy, but it's labeled as such. It's a, a fairly narrow scope because there are only a small set of practices that are explicitly um, called strategic. Uh, I mean, still a large scope, but much smaller than from the other. The advantage if you take that view, it's, it's easy to identify. So you look at those practices, those activities that are explicitly um, uh, labeled strategic. Yeah. For example, uh, Healy uh, and colleagues in their uh, British Journal of Management study, they study strategy workshops as strategic practice. And these strategy workshops are labeled strategic. Or uh, uh, Paul Spee and Paula Jaskowski in their SO paper say, we shift our attention to what actually happens when individuals use strategy tools, those activities that are linked to strategy tools. Yeah. So in that sense, it has something, the activity itself is kind of labeled strategic. The second view is um, we could say all of those activities and all of those practices that strategists do are strategic or strategically relevant. Huh? That's a very wide scope of practices because 
strategists do a lot of things, a lot of mundane things, a lot of things that we might not per se consider strategic, apart from the fact that they are done by the strategists, in that sense, um, we would uh, um, study them. Uh, the advantage here of this view is also it's easy to identify because we have, just have to follow the strategists and look at what they do. So for example, Samra Fredericks in her well-known paper in this uh, um, seminal special issue, JMS special issue said that she did a fine-grained analysis of strategists' real-time deployment of relational rhetorical skills, continuous strategic practice. So the strategists are doing something and that's strategic in that sense. Or Matthias Wenzel and Jochen Koch in their um, recent SMJ paper looked at keynote speeches of CEOs. So CEOs do keynote speeches, so that's something strategic and I looked at this. So that's the second view. The third view is um, uh, we can say those practices, those activities are strategic that are consequential, that have in some way or other consequences for the firm. Yeah? Again, here, a very wide scope of practice it includes a lot of many mundane practices that ultimately in some way or other might have strategic consequences. The problem here is a little bit that it's difficult to identify these pra uh, practices in real time. You can often only identify them retrospectively when you can see the consequences. Yeah. Or Paula, in her recent uh, um, paper that I just referred to, she said, yeah, well, but as a researcher, particularly as an uh, ethnographer, you might have a hunch that something is uh, consequential. But still, I mean, it's difficult to identify. So an example of that is uh, also in um, our human relations um, paper in 2007, where we um, went for such a definition, um, where we said we adopt the broader view that activity is considered strategic to the extent that it is consequential for the strategic outcomes, direction, survival, and competitive advantage of the firm, even where these consequences are not part of an intended and formally articulated strategy. Now, let me uh, come to the fourth view. Uh, we can say all those practices and activities are strategic or strategically relevant that are constitutive of the pattern in the stream of actions. Going back to, um, to, to uh, Mintzberg's definition of strategy as a pattern in a stream of actions. Uh, and that's a very wide scope. It includes uh, a lot of many mundane uh, practices. And two examples here, um, uh, Linda Rollo's well-known uh, study on middle managers in JMS. There she says uh, she wants to understand uh, middle managers' contributions in sustaining competitive advantage through their everyday activities. Yeah, he says it appears that middle managers strategize by enacting a set of micro practices that are uh, produced in each routine and conversation surrounding their strategic change. Yeah. And uh, just recently, uh, um, Robert Chia and his colleagues um, in human relations, they um, um, wrote, um, they are looking at um, the multitude of coping actions taken at the cold face of an organization that congeal inadvertently over time into an organizational modus operandi. Modus operandi, in other words, in kind of pattern in the stream of actions of the organization. Yeah? And you could say that's a fourth view, and that includes a lot of practices, because anything that sort of uh, um, contributes to this stream, uh, to this pattern in the stream of activities is part of, um, it can be considered strategic. So with my last slide, let me just briefly compare these different views, because depending on what view you take, um, the empirical scope of strategies practice is narrow, wider, and um, has different challenges. So in the first view, uh, you treat those activities and practices as strategic that are labeled strategic. Um, you could say, well, here the practitioner defines for you what practices to look at, yeah? whatever the practitioner's label strategic. It's a narrow range of practices, and um, the advantage is the identification can be done ex ante. You know, in advance when the practice happens, that this is a strategic practice because it's labeled strategic. The second view is, um, where all practices are considered strategic that are done by strategists, again, the practitioner defines what is um, strategic uh, because whatever the, uh, the strategy practitioner does is in that sense, uh, strategic or st strategic relevant. Uh? The scope here is wide. Yeah? A lot of activities come into view. And again, like in the first view, you can identify these activities and practice in advance as ex ante, as strategic. Now with the third view, yeah, though if you consider those 
practice and activities as a strategic that are consequential for the firm. It's a researcher who defines what is a strategic practice. Yeah? The range again is wide. Yeah? The identification, as I mentioned already before, is often just ex post. Yeah? Or uh, you might have a hunch, but just a hunch. And the fourth view, uh, where you consider all those uh, activities and practices as strategic that are part of the pattern in the stream of actions, again, is the researcher who defines the uh, practices as strategic. It's a very wide range of activities, probably even uh, much wider than all the others. And the identification of those practices might be just exposed or sometimes ex ante if it's a recurring pattern in the stream of actions. So with this, I close sort of my part on sort of the empirical domain of strategist practice and hand over to Richard, who will talk about the different uh, theoretical perspectives that strategy as practice has uh, um, um, uh, um, has in, um, can, can draw on to explore the different empirical phenomena. With this, I hand over to you, Richard. Thanks, David. That was great. I brought back some fond memories as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, anyway, um, I'm going to share my screen if I can and continue. Here we are. Uh, is that good, Verpi? Thank you. Super. Um, well, as uh, I said, it's great to see you all after 10 years. And frankly, um, Julia was right. I never expected to have this moment. 10 years ago, or maybe 12 or 13 years ago, when Julia started the hard work of getting this going, Jerry and I were kind of, well, I was politely skeptical. I suspect Jerry wasn't always politely skeptical, but Julia persuaded us and we did all work together. And um, thanks to Julia's energy and entrepreneurship, we have the, uh, interest group that we have today, which has been a great success. I can also reflect back on, I think it was Julia and David touched on this, this moment when um, Jerry, I think in particular, agonised in front of everybody, saying, this would have been about 2001, I don't think this is a really good idea, we could be killing all your careers, um, you know, go and do mainstream strategy, do a few regressions, you'll be all right. That's much the best way of doing things. But then Verpi showed that photograph of that group ten, who assembled 10 years ago. They were the early members of the Strategist Practice Group. I, can, I could see, oh, I don't know, Linda, Klaus, Saku Mantri, Erovara, Tomi Laman, and Verpi, you may have noticed lots and lots of fins. Um, and so on and so forth. Who else did I see? Satiris Perutis, um, uh, who, Paula Jarzakowski, of course, as well as Julia, David and myself and others, Curtis LeBaron and Anne Smith. Um, so um, I think almost all of them are now professors. And um, in a, uh, Julia indeed is a dean, David is a head of a department of a chair, I'm temporarily and regretfully running a strategy group at the moment. And by the way, I'm hiring. And many of these other people who've come through are hiring too. So it's still a good place to make a career, I think, SAP. Um, that's my anecdote. What I want to talk about is uh, SAP theories and theory. And by this, I want to um, raise issues around um, the various perspectives, the main perspectives that are extant in strategist practice research at the moment. I'll make an argument and propose some ways of um, making connections between those perspectives. And then I'll consider what was early on certainly and may still be a thorny question. Is SAP a theory in itself? What is its status? Is it, does it have a, the status of a theory? I, here I shall make a cheeky comparison, okay? So uh, SAP, theories, perspectives, connections, and the status of SAP as a theory. I'm gonna make the strong claim towards the end. Okay. Have we got my slide going? Right, next slide. 
Yeah. Okay. So um, another fin. I have two fins here. Marke Ketamaki, Aerovara, uh, Rodrigo Rabadino, not a Finnish name, and myself. Um, just published a paper last month in the International Journal of Management Reviews, reviewing the literature over the last quarter century, somewhat egocentrically, um, date, choosing the date of um, the strategies practice paper in long range planning that David referred to early. Yeah. And what you can see, as David showed, is a steady increase in publications. We looked at ABS3 or ABS4 journals, the so-called better journals, um, which excludes books and um, handbooks and many other influential articles over the years. But what we find is an increasing group of um, papers, about 340 in all over that period in those journals. A couple of things which are worth noting since Aerovar and I did the last literature review or substantial literature review, I think in academy management annals, is the growth of new streams of work, particularly those connecting to institutional theory. And there, um, one of David's papers dating back to 2011 has been very influential. Socio-material um, perspectives there, Paula and Sarah, Paula Jarzakowski and Sarah Kaplan have been influential. Discursive perspectives, Aero Vara has been important there and sense-making, many people have been important in there. Um, Sally Maitlis was one of the foundational papers in that spa space as well. So, um, and then there's the Praxis, core Praxis group focused on strategizing, which may or may not have been so um, theoretically informed, but particularly focusing on what David called earlier microactivity. The focus, I think, of the 2003 Journal of Management Studies paper uh, a, a special issue on micro strategizing. Incidentally, the title of that um, special issue was um, decided by accident. I missed the plane to Nice and Leif Melin and Jerry Johnson decided micro strategizing. I would have put practice in the title if I caught the plane, but there you go. Um, so practice is still a very important part of it, but we, what we see recently is the growth of particularly institutional and social material perspectives amongst um, the various papers. Now I'm going to ask the question here, are these separate communities in a sense competing with each other or at least working largely on their own, or are they communities which have greater potential for connection? And my argument will be, as you might expect, there is potential for connection. And I'm going to suggest what um, uh, Mary Jo Hatch and Mike and Schultz have called in the past various crossing strategies to make those connections. But first, in the paper that Mark Katamaki uh, and ourselves put together, we identify six clusters of research cited in SAP papers. They are those you've already seen, the social material, discursive institutional practice and sense making, and very often too, the process work of people like um, Kathy Eisenhart, Robert Bergelman, and Andrew Pettigrew, and of course, Henry Mintzberg. Um, we put those aside, they're not part of the SAP community strictly, but they are an important community upon which we draw. But the mapping, the software of the mapping is able to establish quite um, how often each group cites other groups. So in the yellow box, we explain the relative distance between the various blobs, nice colorful Lego colors here. Um, the distance between the blobs indicates roughly the likelihood of cross citation. So the discursive group, which includes quite a strong uh, critical management studies component, is less likely to cite the praxis group of studies than say the institutional or the social material and not so likely to um, draw upon process work whereas the praxis group often does. Okay so there's a sense that um, the communities are somewhat separate and in fact uh, Marco and, and colleagues, Katamaki and colleagues, we found that um, there's a great deal of incestuousness within those groups, not as much cross citation as one might perhaps look for. Okay, so um, that's 
the problem we have. We have several very interesting streams of research emerging, institutional, social, material, and discursive. Um, but uh, what we don't have at the moment, or what we may have, is a separation between those groups. So I'm going to draw upon um, the Schultz and Hatch Academy Management Review paper, where they discuss crossing strategies between different paradigms. What they want to avoid is paradigm integration, which they argue is too glib. What they argue, though, instead of a sort of homogenizing merger, is explicit and self-conscious crossing strategies. And they identify three, sequential strategy, a bridging strategy, and an interplay strategy. They're described here, and I'll explain them a little bit further. The sequential strategy basically implies later communities can learn from the research understandings and progress of earlier research in another community. So you can add to another cluster of research. A bridging strategy is again, not just simply integration, but it's creating a new theoretical lens or theoretical frame in order to bring the two together. And the interplay strategy is to respect difference but say we can borrow some things from one community and introduce them into another. So the interplay structure strategy um, involves maintaining differences and respecting differences, but building on some of the overlaps or similarities where they exist. I'm going to quickly suggest where those can work. So a sequential uh, crossing strategy, i.e., adding to earlier insights, is exactly what the praxis tradition did originally, um, and that was what Praxis did, what we did in micro-strategizing was we looked in, at the practices inside the processes. So within the strategic planning process, we identified things that David referred to, like strategy workshops, um, which hadn't really been identified as a thing in broader strategy, more macro-orientated, organisation-orientated process studies. So that's a multi-level analysis. The reverse can happen. And that's, um, we can look at practices, praxis as they change through processes of evolution over time. So praxis can adopt from the process um, perspective, multi-level uh, multi appreciation of temporal change. Uh, the discursive um, tradition can, of course, use multimodal level uh, methods to capture new forms of discourse, whether they're on social media, or they can use video, ethnographic techniques, um, ethnography, and similar kinds of um, different methods to expand the repertoire of discourses um, which people study. So there are ways in which you can use a sequential crossing strategy to add to earlier insights. Discourse is important. Now, that what the social material perspective can do is say, yes, and what difference does it make if it's on social media? What difference does it make if it's at a, an analyst presentation? What difference does it make if it's an away day and purely verbal interaction? So those are the sorts of things that uh, a, a crossing strategy, a sequential crossing strategy can achieve. Bridging crossing strategies connect through common theoretical frames. So the praxis and the institutional um, tradition can be connected through what Michael Smets has developed as practice-driven institutionalism. Mike Lounsbury as well is working on that, and that very much takes some um, inspiration from what David Seidel was doing way back, nearly 10 years ago, in his strategic organisation paper with Roy Sutterby and Jane Lee. Uh, on the other hand, the wor work of Anne Langley and Harry Sukas offers what's called a strong process ontology in which everything all processes dissolve into continuous flows of activity. Strong process and ontology can link very much with the activity focus of praxis in order to provide a common theoretical frame which can illuminate new issues. We discussed that in the Bergelman et al. paper in the Strategic Management Journal 2018. Um, last of these strategies is the interplay crossing strategy. Uh, the discourse, discursive um, community, particularly those from the critical management studies side, very much emphasise that power is something that has been left out in practice studies. Certainly, 
um, there's a great deal for Praxis people to the Praxis community to learn about power and they need to or they should be able to incorporate that without radically changing their own perspective, but at the same time considerably broadening that perspective. So you can imagine a crossing strategy in that sense. To go on, what I'm arguing for is that this original slide, which was showing growth, but also the emergence of distinct communities is an opportunity. I've laid out, laid out a few crossing strategies, but what I'm arguing for is the potential to develop more crossing strategies. So although we lay those out in, in the um, IJMR paper earlier this year, there's many more things that we can do. Renata, you've raised your hand. Or not? Julia's raised her hand. Okay, so um, I'm not sure I'm getting anything here, but perhaps you can put in the text. I got an eye on the text here on the chat. Okay, so uh, there are many perspectives. There's benefits to connecting these perspectives. But what about SAP status as a whole? Is SAP more than just a set of perspective? And can we consider it um, uh, actually a theory in itself? I, the paper's on open access, by the way. Um, that's speaking to Roberto on the um, chat. Open access at the International Journal of Management Reviews. Is SAP more than a set of perspectives or actually a theory in itself? Or is it to go back to the old jibe that I think Andrew Pettigrew originally uh, made? Is SAP a trivial collection of um, studies not explaining very much? not rising to the level of a, of a theory on its own. I will argue, you might expect me to, but it is a theory. Uh, here are just a few frameworks, many of these will be familiar to you. What you see in all of these is SAP's frameworks always try to explain something, and they do that by, by connecting practices, people, and activity. Perhaps the paper of uh, the uh, model in the bottom left hand corner, the Jarzakowski et al. paper in Strategic Organization 2016, is the most clear about that. Strategy as practice is a a has a theory of how outcomes come about. And that's that combination of practices, practitioners, the who, and praxis, the how. And the outcomes feed back and change those original practices, practitioners, and, and praxis. So there is a theory, and I believe that we can build well on that theory, and that is one of the things we should do. So I'm not gonna claim that we're quite in the same territory of Einstein with E equals MC squared. I will though note that we too have three terms, practices, practitioners, and praxis. And, what I would argue that we should always do as far as we can is think practices, yeah, in some way they are created by the practitioners working in praxis. That practices are continuously created. Praxis relies upon the practices of practitioners. And practitioners are in some sense, the carriers of practice and the enactors of practices in praxis. They're always connected. So to end up, with um, Albert Einstein, the great man himself. Yes, SAP is informed by many theoretical perspectives. Wonderful that we now have such a burgeoning growth of social material, discursive and uh, institutional perspectives, especially. There are various crossing strategies available in order to build connections between those theoretical perspectives. I see potential for great insight there. And fundamentally, SAP does have status as a theory in itself, and through its connections of practices, practitioners, and praxis, that can be a rich source of complementary, um, mutually informative research. And for that agenda of complementary, mutually informative research, there are lots of methodologies 
available. And that is my cue, I think, for Julia. Thank you. I might pick up a few of your questions. Um, now I stop rattling on um, uh, in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. My turn to try and share my screen now, um, which shouldn't be too difficult, hopefully. Here we go. Oh, is that right? Have I done that right, VP? Good, it's working. Okay. Um, well, yes. Oh, hang on. I've changed. I've changed. I've changed the. Uh, have I changed? Have I shared the right screen? Hang on a minute. Uh, yes, I have. There we go. Let's try again. Many apologies. <laughs> For a minute, I was panicked and I thought I shared the wrong screen. Okay. Well, as Richard said, it's fallen to me to talk about methods. So uh, the main reason it's fallen to me to talk about methods is that. Um, uh, is working yes is that uh it refers back to this paper that was in the 2003 special issue three responses to the methodological challenges of study strategizing so what i'm going to do is reflect back on this paper and see see what advances we've made since then and more to the point maybe were the things we said then right i'm not sure all of them were um so what do we say in this paper basically we said that when we're looking at methods um there are five things we should consider uh, if we're really serious about understanding strategizing and strategizing practices on what people are doing, uh, we need data that's contextual. So it gathers data that, that brings into bear the context that these people are working in. It's longitudinal, so we can track what they're doing. That goes down multiple levels, so we can understand the different people involved. Because if we believe in the work of uh, strategy work, not just being the preserve of senior managers, but when you get into change, it goes down the organisation, for example, and affords comparison between organisations. The thing, of course, we need to do this work is access. So informants, uh, if we're going to have this longitudinal access, we need informants who have full and willing participation, which of course means they need to find the research interesting and enjoyable. So to that, we also said, well, that relates to the questions we ask, because the questions have to be interesting and relevant to organizational collaborators for them to find it interesting, and enjoyable and stay involved. Similarly, we potentially have to go beyond research feedback to feedback that is useful to the practitioners that helps them to develop their practice um, so that they see what we're doing as useful and relevant. And finally, we need uh, methodologies that uh, help researchers with their time. Uh, if we're going to be in these organizations collecting lots of, collecting large amounts of uh, complex data, we need ways, and we're going down to do three levels, we need ways um, that simplifies the task for us, helps us organize the task, and helps us analyze what large amounts of data. So what we did in the paper was to look at three what in the 1990s and 2000s would have been considered less traditional methods for collecting data. Um, first of all, we looked at interactive discussion groups. Uh, we were largely talking about things like focus groups. The idea being that as you go down organizations, if you bring people who work together together in a focus group, you can spend two hours with a group of six or seven people rather than doing seven one hour interviews. There are various advantages to these discussion groups in the sense that you get the snowball technique that they might enable you to get deeper data because they bounce off each other. Um, but I, I have to add that, of course, since then, uh, the, 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 if you like, partly the, the tools we have available, uh, we've moved beyond doing thus these discussion groups. Of course, as we focus on practice, use other means of collecting data from our collective sessions. So for example, workshops um, have become a common means on which we collect data. Uh, it could be uh, looking at not just workshops of people doing strategic planning, but we've also of course had work that looked at workshops uh, conceiving of strategy or what change should look like through Lego construction or other forms of sculpting. Uh, we've looked at narrative groups where people are building stories and narrative boards about the changes they want to put in place. So interactive discussion groups could be a, a rich way of collecting data. We also talked about self-report, by which we were largely looking at things like diaries. But of course, there's been huge technological enhancement now, again. So uh, we could be looking at video blocks. In fact, there's a paper I seem to remember in organizational research methods that looks at, you know, practitioners 
sitting in front of a video and doing a video blog for the researchers of their recent experiences in terms of strategy development and change. So you can capture reflections from practitioners through either just talking into a phone, through doing a video blog, all kinds of uh, technology enabled enhanced ways now. And then finally, of course, there is practitioner-led research. The notion is that the practitioners generate and collect the data themselves through some means, such as action learning sets or appreciative inquiry. I think we still do very little of that, but we can come back to that. Uh, then what we also did was then say, well, OK, if we're using these methods, how are, we trans uh, how are we challenging traditional assumptions? So what I've done here is look at the traditional assumptions that we said we needed to challenge in 2003 with some new assumptions and how well we've done on that. So who sets the research question? The researcher or the research with organisational collaborators? I think, to be fair, by the 2000s, we were already working with organisational collaborators. Uh, we were already, already had people working closely with practitioners, maybe using their engagement through executive education to actually set research questions. But we're also starting to develop certainly consortia and sponsored research that enabled us to think about new organisational phenomena we should be looking into. I have to when it comes to new organisational phenomena, Richard has been particularly imaginative there looking at things like open strategizing. We're talking about things like the IBM strategy jams. There's been lots of opportunities to look at new phenomena. Uh, the next assumption we talked about was the relationship with site. Uh, typically, it was seen as being as arms, arm's length and contractual, whereas the new assumptions were around alliances or consortium. And I'd always, I'd even say collaboration. Uh, there is, uh, you know, um, a, a thing here that there was this assumption in research that if you in any way got involved in the context and influence it, your research was illegitimate. I afraid, I'm afraid I regularly challenge that. Just by being there, we influence. Just by asking, sending someone a questionnaire, we influence. We force people to reflect on what they're doing by answering the questionnaire. And we will potentially get them by reflecting on their practice to change practice. So let's not be naive about the extent to which any, any research intervenes in the context, because it does. Um, but certainly uh, the relationship with site can be enhanced through uh, industry consortia. I've done industry consortia. Paula Yarzapkowski has spent the last few years involved with a very big industry consortia across insurance. Um, I do, though, sometimes think some of the questions we face about our research could now be even more challenging than that. There's lots of questions about open data. Can we, if we do these big studies, make it create open data? Or is that going to be too threatening to the organisations we engage with? Also about the ethics clearance. It's quite right we have ethics clearance, of course, but we do have to jump through far more hoops in terms of justifying the way we collect data. And that's not actually to the organisations we're engaged with. <laughs> that's to our that's to our universities. So there are some challenges to doing this type of research that have become more prevalent than they were when we were first writing this paper. Well, how data is collected, obviously I've talked about already about original techniques and the idea is the new assumptions were that these different techniques support more traditional ethnographic and unobtrusive methods. And I think we've seen a lot of progress here. Uh, the big game changer I think has been video and the ability to capture workshops and practice in flight. We've got a lot of video studies now. Uh, the paper that David mentioned uh, in org studies by me and Katie Best actually was a work studies paper that used videos and therefore relied on uh, images from those videos to actually get across the points we wanted to make. Um, so uh, so this, is, this is hugely enabling because it overcomes the downside of reporting observation. What I mean by that, you know, previously you might have been having to sort of two or three pe people, people sitting in a workshop to catch what's going on. Now you just need one person with a video camera. Uh, the other thing I would say as a qualitative researcher is you have tacit knowledge. You know stuff about your site that can sometimes be quite hard to get across. Well, modern technology with the videos, the ease of taking photos enables so much much more than you to explain and account for so much more. It also enables us to gain access to things that previously used to be quite difficult, like effect and emotion. So the access we have through emails, blogs, videos, technology enabled uh, um, interaction, we're using these techniques have really advanced the research we're able to do on strategy as practice. A lot of the research we've done would have been incredibly difficult without the, 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 the enhancements we have these days through technology. Who collects and owns data? Well, I'm not really sure we've taken much advance on that, um, but I do think insiders have equal ownership rights. And that's actually important when we publish data. Um, there, you know, there is a responsibility to us in terms of how we publish the data, because we are typically publishing, publishing on some fairly confidential aspects of organizational processes. Um, relationship with participants. 
It says traditionally often distant and often distant and detached. Apologies, I have got a bit of a cold. Not coronavirus, I don't think, but I have got a bit of a cold. So apologies. Um, excuse me a minute. So new assumptions, informers, informants as collaborators in data collection and report. Uh, what I've said here, outsiders coach to encourage self-reflection. Insiders coach to encourage more subtle understanding. Well, I actually do think we've done that. Close, closest to practitioners does enable that. I personally have a belief that working in close proximity to practitioners enables far more knowledge exchange and knowledge transfer than does, for example, executive education interventions. Doesn't mean we shouldn't run executive education interventions, but working alongside practitioners does enable a knowledge sharing and a knowledge exchange that isn't necessarily as um, available in other forms of um, um, research. So. Uh, um, you know, more use of maybe things like action, um, action learning groups or something like that. Maybe not whilst we're doing the research, but sharing our findings at the end with executives and getting their, um, their reflections on what we've done. That enables us to be these coaches, getting them to reflect more on their theories and use and their practice, but also understand enables us to share our understanding and get their feedback on our uh, you know, how well we understand their worldview or whether we've misunderstood things. So that mutual exploring, that mutual learning experience is happening, but I'm not sure we're doing much, as much of it as we should. Um, who analyzes data? You were suggesting it should be a joint effort. I don't think that happens, but I would refer to above and talk about the mutual reflection process, which is, which is possible. Um, I think then the next one, skills level, I think this is a really interesting one. Uh, you know, we've got here traditional assumption, researcher as hero, traditional research skills. What were the new assumptions we suggested in 2003? Multiple skills required. Traditional training augmented by skills in facilitation, team development, consultancy, client facing, interpersonal, political. These are all true if we're going to have access in organizations and works alongside practitioners. And we really see some people developing these skills. So uh, the work going on in Paula's extensive ethnographic work in the insurance industry would be an exact example of that. And her and some of her team members have a great paper in human relations about that and how they run this multi-site, multi-team ethnographic uh, project in a way that enables them to collect and share data and share reflections on their findings. But that really emphasizes the nature of the skills you need, actually not just in working with the client, but in building the research teams among academics. And then um, feedback, I suppose I've already touched on that. It's often minimal, typically at the end of study, you shouldn't do that, that interferes in the context. Well, I think we have various forms and often provided for progress. We offer something in return for access. Um, there are challenge about how we do it without creating challenges to uh, legitimize the research, um, given preconceptions, you will get challenged when you publish and you can get public challenged. Um, but I think there is general acceptance that a quality of access is a trade off. Um, I don't see many challenges these days uh, to, uh, you know, what has been collaborative research circumstances. Um, but we do be, have to be willing to justify what we do. And I think there are many ways of working with organizations and giving feedback, not just with consortia, but the sites we work with, uh, without actually, um, without actually uh, you know, damaging the research. You can provide anonymized feedback on what's happening in organizations without actually being the people that suggest interventions, without being involved in the design. Um, so the, I think some of this is happening more than it used to, and it is more accepted. But there are also other advances we've made, um, certainly use of quantitative studies to facilitate comparison. We've actually done relatively little of this. I mean, I think Rich has done a quantitative study. There are things you can, you can look at quantitatively because we do need to be able to compare across organizations. And actually that is quite difficult, with large qualitative studies. Some people like Paula are doing it, but it, the, there, are, there is potential for quantitative studies. We maybe haven't exploited that as much as we should. The other things we've been doing is maybe compl complexifying our research by extending our, the reach of our research agendas. For example, exploring open strategizing. David's mentioned the different practitioners involved. Well, open strategizing involves us extending potentially even further, 
looking at other people that are, get involved in strategy processes, other stakeholders that are involved in the situation. So that, that complicates the process even more. So there's many different ways in which we are extending our reach in terms of our methodologies. It's the technological leap in particular that has made a huge difference, I think, and enabled a lot of the work we're doing. I'm not sure without some of those technologies that some of the work we're doing would have been possible. So, I mean, um, maybe something I haven't talked about enough about here, and I think Richard kind of touched on this, something about bringing together studies by different people or knowledge we have. And I was, you know, I think actually, you know, I think it maybe it was David that touched, we both touched on them. I'm not sure we've done enough to bring together studies in the field. Um, cross organizational uh, studies, you know, um, studies where you have lots of organizations involved are quite difficult to do, quite difficult to run. We do have enough projects now that we could potentially bring together our collections of data. So, for example, I did that with Linda Rulu, where we did a, a paper based on bringing together different case studies we had from different settings. I actually suspect, given the amount of data we've got, we could do more of that. It's certainly possible to pool data, pool our knowledge. So, the paper I wrote in AMJ with Paula and Jane. Uh, that certainly was about pooled knowledge. We used their data, but the insights we had on that data came from pooled knowledge from other studies I've done as well as the studies they've done. But it remains hard, uh, but I suspect we are throwing away an awful lot of the data we have by not pooling the data we have and considering how we can utilize more the studies we've already got. Um, I think the final point I would raise is that a lot of what we were talk I was talking about in this 2003 paper with Anne Huff and uh, Phil Johnson as underpinned by a certain epistemology and ontology. Um, not everybody, of course, in the field shares that epistemology and ontology. We, our position was that to get at still skilled practice, or for that matter, unskilled practice, um, it requires engagement, very much engagement with practitioners. And you can't get at motivation, intent, um, knowledge, however we define knowledge, I'm not going to get into that debate, um, just by observation. You need to actually work with the practitioners to understand some of those things. Having said that's not an, an ontology and epistemology shared by everybody, I would point out that I think one thing we have done incredibly well as a field is to stay open. Um, over the years, we have, uh, I, we, have, we have shown that we are very tolerant of each other's perspective, because we understand the value of that plurality. We understand that all these different perspectives bring something different to the party. And I think that's something we can genuinely celebrate, is the extent to which we do embrace different epistemologies and ontology and celebrate what they bring to the field. I'll finish there, thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. And thank you also for for Richard and David for your inter interesting uh, discussions about the embryos of, of strategy as practice, the theory of strategy as practi practice, and the methodologies of strategy as practice. And, and now I actually uh, would like to invite the audience um, to participate. And, and if you have questions or reflections that you would like to present now, uh, you could raise your hand or, or write your comment in the in the chat, and um, and we, the panelists, could uh, respond now to your your questions, and and uh, then we move on to to uh, to the final discussion. So so now there's a great chance to to ask from the distinguished keynote panel what you have always liked to ask. I, I'm going to mispronounce somebody's name. Is it Reuven? Is Reuven able to speak to her, his or her question? Do they want to? Reuven, if you're able to open your mic, please do so.
Lepi, I think it's up to you to unmute. Okay, I, I think I need to unmute the... Uh, okay. Sorry, just a second. Yes, now it should be open. Yeah, uh, hi everyone. I'm not sure if you can hear me, um, but I, I guess so. So um, yeah, I was just um, listening to, to Richard and, and David and, and Julian. I'm, I'm, I'm very intrigued by the development of the SAP division. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very young scholar, so I don't have all the um, historical uh, implicit knowledge about the roots of this development. And I was just now, my observation was that um, SAP research seems to have roots and also be currently uh, mainly enacted in Europe. I'm not, I'm not sure if this um, observation is valid. That would be the first question. And then second, I was interested in, yeah, in the historical reasons and perhaps also the implications of that. And um, I mean, the, de the, the development of the group and the community is very impressive, right? So um, was this perhaps an advantage because people you know, interacted much more deeply, um, but perhaps um, is, is this also problematic um, if this development and this community is rather Europe-based? Um, this is a little bit, um, or some of the thoughts I had. And I would really be interested in, in, in hearing um, what Richard, David, and Julie have to say about that. I can start saying something on that if you want me to. I think that uh, quite correct. So I think strategy as practice as I see it, I mean, people reconstruct it in different ways. So it's always a construction history, it's always a construction. But as I see it, I, I think it is uh, distinctively European in its roots. And um, uh, even though uh, um, the US Americans also uh, uh, contributed to it and came in, but the roots I would say are European also, I mean, practice theory, being mainly a European uh, um, project, also the diversity, and you asked about uh, the, 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 the um, implications of uh, the European roots. You could say that um, in Europe, we have a diversity of different uh, technical approaches, um, uh, also uh, um, country-based, different approaches, different uh, theorists. And I think that might have contributed to the diversity of uh, strategy as practice. And I think as Julia highlighted in particular, um, we are very diverse um, community and uh, with very many different uh, theoretical perspectives. I think even the, the founders, even Richard uh, Life and, and Jerry had some very different ideas and came from very different angles to the to strategy as practice. And that I think uh, is, the, is part of the spirit of strategy as practice, which has, I think, something to do with uh, this being uh, originally a very European project which now I think uh, is worldwide and is not uh, European anymore. But I think the start for me, I would also say uh, is uh, European. But the others might have different views on that. Can I add something? Um, I think it's a really good question. I think undoubtedly the early work came mostly from Europe. But um, I mentioned that some of the papers in the Journal of Management Studies special issue 2003 a couple of the authors were canadian so there have always been some north american um uh roots people like sarah kaplan and smith Kirsten, Kirsten LeBaron, and others have taken leadership roles in the strategy as practice interest group based in american universities um and the strategic management journal special issue had articles and this is the point i want to underline um from the united states australia but also from India. And one of the things that I think we can do and should do is to harness, ah, oh, I see Rosalia from Brazil. Um, what I really hope we can do much more of is um, harness perspectives from developing economies, from the global south, from non-traditional capitalist societies. What are the strategy practices in China, where McKinsey and BCG and indeed business schools until recently haven't had much purchase. What about India, where business schools are very important, but there, again, there are different traditions. Brazil too, business schools are very important, but different kinds of um, context. So I think the diversity, the geographical diversity of the strategy as practice interest group is a potential strength that we haven't harnessed well enough yet especially by comparison with the traditional STR strategy um, 
uh, group at the Academy of Management, which is dominated by American thinking. That seems, in today's day and age, very exclusive and very narrowing. We have a huge opportunity to mobilize research in different geographical, cultural contexts. Could I just, just build on what Richard was going to say? I was going to say something similar. I mean, the, the attraction of the strategies practice group is its diversity. So you might say, and certainly the names Richard has named have been great contributors, but you might say we're most active outside of the US. Um, but what we have is a huge international footprint. Um, and as Richard says, that shows up in the special issues we've done, but also for me and the people we have involved in our sessions. So it would be wrong to say it is mainly European. Um, very wrong, uh, because we now do have a really big global footprint. Thank you. So then there's a question from Georg Reischauer and uh, then uh, Julia Rank. And after that, we will move on to our discussion, which actually also relates to Roberto Camara's uh, question about the future of strategy as practice. So go ahead. Georg, and, and then after that, Julia. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Julia, David, and Richard for these great insights. I was just uh, wondering, uh, since it uh, was a topic across all your presentations, your views and perhaps recommendations on uh, how, uh, as of today, uh, conduct a multi-level SAP research, especially perhaps you know with some new data, um, speaking about digital data, so also perhaps triangulating different uh, yeah, kinds of uh, new new data. I'm not sure I entirely understand your question, Georg. So you want to know ideas about data collection or types of data? Uh, sorry, data collection. Yeah, the first one. Across levels. When you say across levels, you talk about across levels in organizations. Are you talking about external and internal? Um, uh, the first one, so like the so different, uh, for example, the organizational level connecting uh, perhaps with different, also with the different um, uh, tools that perhaps are used and also how this could be perhaps meaningfully be combined. Okay. Um, well, I, 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 I'm going to sort of hedge my bets a bit and say I think it depends on the type of the organization you're working with and the four they have that provides opportunities. Um, that you know, sort of a, a useful way of tracking can be, for example, um, can be, for example, um, using meetings, for example, using workshops. The organizations themselves often have lots of venues, naturally occurring venues, which you can use to collect data. Um, it, and it depends on the stage they're at, you know, if they're, uh, if they're just, for example, uh, I'm sorry, I mean, I don't know if I'm really asking a question. They're just developing strategy. It might be largely sort of more senior people involved. And there might be several venues you can gain access to. If they start producing change, there is some sorts of formula that organizations use, which usually involve an awful lot of workshops to communicate that you then can follow and get data from. Um, it, of course, depending on what you're studying, you could use questionnaires, you could take a quantitative approach. Um, whereby um, there's, there's something about the change process you want to gather particular data on. I don't know to do with, say, effect, or some people have done it for resistance, for example. Um, you could gain access to large numbers of lower level people and do questionnaires to look at particular aspects. There's many different things you could do, but it really depends on the nature of the organization you're engaged with, the practices they're engaging in, and the research question you're answering, asking. Great, thanks. I'll just. Oh, comment. sorry. There's possibility. I, I, there's the also of linking from the organisation, the specific organisation, to the larger institutional field, for want of a better word. Um, David will have talked about that too. But um, I think again, Julia mentioned quantitative studies. I think it's it's interesting to track the diffusion of practices find practices which are either emergent or in crisis or in, in moment of change. Those practices might, um, emergent practices might be things like artificial intelligence and strategy or open strategy um, and, or, and uh, practice in crisis is perhaps strategic planning, at least as traditionally done. And then 
plunge deep into those things which are a macro societal level phenomenon, these changes in strategy practices, and then look deeply at how that plays out on the ground, how new practices are created, old practices are adapted or rescued or finally abandoned. That, that's what I would try and do. So a broad study to start with, an ethnographic deep dive to finish up, up with. Lovely, thank you. Should we move on to the next question? Uh, Julia, would you like to present your question next? Yes, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And I was uh, mainly inspired for your uh, by your suggestion to com combine the different um, fields like sociometriology and discourse. And what would you suggest, um, maybe if you go for another combination like social materiality and, and sense making in terms of um, methodology? Should you then combine also the methodology or should you go for one of each? Um, what would you suggest? Uh, I, I'm going to hand it in a moment to Julia if she's happy to take this baton. But I, I will mention that in the, in the paper, we discuss multimodal methods. And I think um, that's, the, that, that's an approach to take where you will use both text and the way in which people use text in action and communicate text in action and interpret text in action. So you have both, the, as it were, the dead text and the live text and the multimodal methods can, can capture, maybe contrast both at the same time. Um, Julie, do you want to pick up this hot, hot biscuit or whatever well, it is? Well, I can, but I have to apologise because, Julia, I was busy typing a reply to your question about articles on sociomateriality and discourse. So can you repeat the question, please? Of course, it's like um, if you go for a kind of another uh, combination like sociomateriality and maybe sense making, what would you suggest in terms of... Um, methodology then okay well um actually i just said you should see the, the special issue the introduction of special at gms special issue 2014 that is all about bringing together uh sense making discourse and power to try to try and understand uh how combining those perspectives um what 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 they can highlight so there's a natural connection between sense making and discourse because um for example um, because, um, you know, people make sense through conversations and what discourse analysis does is, uh, is help you to see um, some of the grand discourses they might be drawing on to legitimise the position they're taking when they sense give and how that influences people who are sense making. Um, so I don't know that we particularly need different methodologies to capture that, but if you were inside an organisation, um, you might want to be looking at what is written and what is available on the in internet. You might also want to look at particular performances, so particular workshops where senior managers are standing up and uh, stating their strategy and also considering the materiality and not just the spoken word. We often do think about discourse as just being words. In fact, um, there are quite a lot of you know, discourse narrative theory would certainly suggest that you also need to be concerned with narrative materiality, for example, and how that influences sense making. So there's many different ways you would be needing to capture uh, what is going on in an organization you wanted to bring together sense making discourse, for example, um, to understand uh, the interaction between the two. Okay, thank you. Yeah, super great. Thank you very much. Great. So then next picky question or difficult question perhaps, or an interesting question for all of us is about the future of strategy as practice research. So um, I heard in all of your presentations uh, a lot of um, ideas about how, uh, about the, the 
potential interesting ways we could do uh, strategy as practice research. So Richard was talking about the um, uh, kind of crossing between the different theories uh, and then Julia about how we uh, could uh, methodologically go beyond what has been done before and also David uh, about the topics that are emerging today uh, in, in strategy as practice research. So now before we uh, finish, um, there was also a question from Robert so that uh, if you look to the future, to next 10 years of strategy as practice, what do you see? And I'll hand over this first to David and, and then Richard and, and then to Julia. Yeah, um, very good question. Um, yeah, maybe I can talk about, I think what is a challenge for strategy as practice, and that's uh, what I would like to talk about a little bit is, I mean, we see uh, that uh, differentiation, diversification uh, within um, strategy as practice uh, Richard talked about the different streams that are emerging. We see uh, also, uh, Richard also and uh, Julia referred to nationally different clusters of people, um, communities, a huge Brazilian cluster uh, of uh, researchers on strategies practice, uh, um, uh, uh, Canadian cluster and so on and so on. So we have a diversification and a differentiation within strategies practice, which is very um, fruitful, very, uh, which is also a sign of the maturity of strategy as practice. Uh, you see that in other fields like institutional theory, they are also differentiated internally and so on. I think that's very good. And the question that comes uh, to my mind or the challenge that we have is how can we cultivate, cultivate this diversity, this fruitful diversity, uh, while at the same time preserving a sense of community? Yeah? Uh, in addition to the differentiation, we also have the growth of this community. Uh, so that uh, we sort of, uh, we don't know every strategy as practice researcher. In the past, we knew all strategy as practice researchers. Now it's not possible anymore. So how can you preserve the sense of community? And I think for strategy as practice, the sense of community was very important, was very helpful. And particularly the community of researchers with very different perspectives coming from different areas and so on. And um, I mean, with, uh, uh, I collaborated very closely with Julia and Paul. We all three came from very different perspectives, had very different ideas and so on. I think, think these collaborations, this knowing each other, this community sense of community feeling is very important. And the question is, how can you keep this community spirit in a growing uh, community uh, that is differentiating different sub-communities. And Anne Langley, interestingly, once uh, suggested, maybe we have to think of strategies practice not as one community, but maybe a community of communities. And maybe that's the way that strategies practice can move into the future. And it's a community of different communities. And maybe with that, I close and hand over to maybe Richard as the next. Okay, yeah, we're a tribe with lots of families in it, and sometimes the families bicker. And, and I think Julia um, will have mentioned, uh, hinted at this at the beginning. There was quite a lot of argument early on. And I think one of the things that has, um, I hope, characterized um, the strategies practice community is respectful difference, readiness to argue, to challenge each other, and so on. I can mention two concrete very concrete, practical things about community. Therpy might be able to give us more details, because of course there is the SAP social late, later this evening. Um, that's my time. So that's gonna be important. Something else practical is to continue to campaign for divisional status. And there's a very material reason behind that. If we become an in, a division rather than an interest group, we collect more revenue from the Academy of Management. And with more revenue, we can have more parties, which could, have, could be nice at the Academy of Management where we're actually all in the same place together again, as I hope we may be next year. Um, talking about communities, there are many, many communities scattered around the world, and David, Julia and I are already talking about that. Katerina has sent us the link um, for the party tonight. Um, and Katerina, by the way, is a great deal... Um, 
is, is due to her because she's a great animator of our, many of our social activities in SAP. So big shout out to Katerina. Um, so we, we have communities from all over the world. I used to sometimes draw a map of the world and ask the question, where did the notion of strategy and structure come from? So I might say Chandler and I put a blob on the map of the world around about Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I say, where did the five forces come from? Porter, another blob around about uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Where did creative destruction and disruptive innovation come from? Well, Schumpeter, blob in Harvard, and um, again, uh, Christensen, blob in Cambridge, Massachusetts. A little bit, but not very much more esoteric, Henry Mintzberg, where did he start his career? Well, just down the road at MIT. Strategy, as a discipline is formed by almost one small town on the neath, northeast coast of the United States, particularly in the 60s and 70s. It's not diverse, it's not inclusive as a discipline. It does not, hasn't taken seriously at all the kinds of ideas, the context and the values which are much more distributed around the world. So, as I said before, I think strategizing, if that's a, the concept we want to focus on, has its limitations. Strategizing is different around the world, and we need to understand the practices as they occur much more around the world. So my vision for 10 years time is an exemplarily diverse division of the academy and management, doing research of the highest quality from all over the world the South as well as the North, and if this is not a kind of Eurocentric concept, uh, the East as well as the West. Um, so we need to build on that diversity in the division that will, uh, I hope, be uh, flourishing and thriving in 10 years time, Roberta, okay? That's me. Well, there's always a danger to going third, isn't there? <laughs> what is left to say? Mind you, my nose is so now blocked off, I'm struggling to speak. Maybe that's not a bad thing. Um, but as I said in the previous session that I was in, um, <clears throat> we are really at quite an exciting time. So I entirely agree with the visions David and Richard has put forward. But I also really look forward to the new forms of strategizing we're going to get to investigate. We have a strategizing might have come out of a small part of the US, but it's a constantly involving practice. The way we do strategy now is nothing like the way we did strategy back in the 50s or 60s when it was first started. So I think what's really exciting for us is how the field of strategizing is going to develop and what what we will there what learn as it develops and for us being there as our as the field of strategizing evolves to capture the way different things are being done around the world and how it evolves and there's a lot of exciting things there i think it's going to be quite easy interesting to see technology um you know i think practicing strategizing through zoom with everybody distributed is uh, quite a challenge but what about virtual reality? What about if we're all in workshops using avatars while sitting at home? Is that feasible? We have this company in Liverpool that does this virtual reality stuff. and We've been playing with some of it. It's great fun. But, you know, is that going to influence our practices? Will we become avatars that interrelate? That's a flight of fancy. But there is a lot of novelty coming along that we want to be there to capture. And so that's what I hope our community will be able to do as it goes forward. I hope it will stay a community and a strong community and a vibrant community, but with that vibrancy driven by the, the, the exciting nature of the research we get to do. Thank you. And as we have two minutes left, I thank all of you, both the panel and the attendees